this is why we're going to begin with this question of um, if you could just describe for us a little of that scene in London where you first started out a, as a musician in the in the 60s, the you know with the UFO club and and the folks who gravitated around that scene. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I think 67 was the year that, that Britain uh, kind of woke up. Um, uh, well, what it went from sort of post-war austerity. Um, everything being kind of black and white. You, you know, you, you see those films from Britain in the 50s. Um, they're, they're, they're probably actually in colour, but um, but everything is black and white. Um, I, I think 67 was the year that that, that, that suddenly you know you know technical burst on the scene. Um, you know, 65, 66. You, you have people like you know Mary Quant and uh, D David Bailey were, were, were kind of shaping the image of swinging London. And 67 was the year. Um, uh, th th there's this big uh, festival called a 24-hour Technicolor Dream, and, and you can Im imagine possibly what that was like, and the substances were, that were uh, absorbed. Um, uh, and it was held in this huge Victorian um, uh, exhibition centre called uh, Alexandra Palace. Uh, it was so big that you could have three bands on at the same time, and uh, if you stood in the middle, you could actually hear all three at once. It was quite exciting. Unfortunately, usually, usually in different keys, but um, it was uh, extraordinary. So, so uh, I, I was still at school there. This was like May '67 when this thing happened. But you know, I, I went with my school friends and we stayed up all night um, at, at this thing. Um, and yeah, there were bands like Soft Machine and the Crazy World of Arthur Brown. And, and we thought, oh, there's, there's this whole scene going on. You know, I, I've been kind of a, a bit of a Who fan up till then. It's a bit of a mod, you know. Um, but, but, but I realized that there's this whole under, underground scene. Um, uh, and um, probably only a month after that, uh, Fairport started to get booked um, at these clubs, uh, it, mostly in London and a few outside of London. Um, th there was a club called the UFO Club, uh, which w was pretty much, um, you know, the home turf of Pink Floyd. Um, and that's where Fairport got signed, uh, Joe Boyd, the, 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 the producer. Um, um, you know, it came in like typical American, typical American. Um, so so c c comes in and says, you guys like to make a record? Um, and this is a bit of a shock because uh, we'd only really been professional for like two months. Um, <laughs> but it, 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 was, it was one of those uh, times when the floodgates were open and, and um, everybody got signed. Even Hap Shash and the Coloured Coat got signed, which gives you some idea of the standard uh, that's being accepted. Um, and it was, it was the time of like the Incredible String Band, the most extraordinary, extraordinary band. Uh, this is world music, but before that they invented the word. I mean, the, the, the Incredibles were just, you know, beyond eclectic. It was just nuts. Um, the, 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 they would play instruments from anywhere, um, some of which that, that they played extremely well. Um, uh, and uh, the, you know, the, the, they're extraordinary at one end of the spectrum, at the, the acoustic end of the spectrum. You have people like uh, Ivor Cutler. Um, that sudden get louder. Did, some, uh, did you lean on something? Okay. <clears throat> uh, Ivor Cutler, who, who is basically uh, just um, a kind of eccentric, he, he plays a little harmonium uh, and he'd recite his poetry. He, he was Scottish um, uh, and he'd recite these sh short stories. Um, Hello, Daddy, what's for tea today? Gruts. But, Daddy, I don't like gruts. We're having gruts for tea, son. We've had gruts every day for the last 42 years. <laughs> but daddy, I, I, I have a cutler. Um, um, you know, as, as well as, you know, the social deviance, that sort of like incredibly discordance, that sort of, sort of proto Ramones or something. Um, uh, Arthur Brown, um, uh, Blossom Toes, um, 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 and, and yet you, you, you had bands, uh, you know, around that time who were just starting out, like Led Zeppelin were just starting out, you know. Um, uh, Pink Floyd were, were um, probably at their best at that time uh, when Sid Barrett was still in the band. Um, Sid was an extraordinary, uh, I, I, th I thought, performer, writer, uh, had this great sense of humour, an incredible sort of whimsical sense of humour. It was just wonderful. And, and Pink Floyd became very dark after he left. Uh, it became a more Roger Waters sort of dark vision of things. Um, but you guys aren't interested in Pink Floyd. This is f folk music. So, so, so let's talk a little bit about that sort of first strand of folk music that you okay. that you got. Well, I, I, with, I, 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 was, let, let me just just, yeah. just, just qualify m m myself, but by going back a few more years to um, 
about 1964, when I started to go to folk clubs in, in, in Britain, um, that there was a very uh, widespread folk scene in the UK um, that, that started sort of 1953-ish with uh, Ewan McCall's uh, Ballads and Blues Club. Uh, Ewan McCall and A.L. Lloyd were, were the two most important figures on, on the British, uh, of, of the British folk revival of the 50s. Um, and, uh, and they started a club. Um, and within, I should, I should think, 10 years uh, of their club, but there, there were probably 300 clubs in, 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 in Great Britain. Great Britain's the size of like New Jersey or something. That's right, very small. So, so it's 300 clubs. Um, so the, the, this was a living for a lot of performers. Uh, you, you, you could play you know, year round. Um, you, you never ran out of venues. Um, it, it was extraordinary. Um, and uh, so, so about 64, I, I started to go to my local folk club uh, in North London, which was called the Black Bull. And I saw um, great performers like, like uh, Daryl, Ad Daryl Adams. Fantastic. Um, uh, Jesse Fuller, uh, Reverend Gary Davis. So these are all Americans who came over on tour. Um, 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 uh, New Lost City Ramblers. Uh, plus, you know, all, all, the, all the British people like Bert Yanch, uh, David Graham, uh, the Watersons, Martin Carthy, uh, incredibly important people, uh, Annie Briggs. Um, and uh, the, the, the only qualification for for, for getting into this club, uh, you, know, you, you paid some you know, small amount of money, but you're supposed to be 18 years old because it was basically the back room of a pub. Like probably 95% of uh, folk clubs in, in the UK, it, it was in the, in the function room, the entertainment room of a pub, usually upstairs. Um, so uh, that was fantastic. And, and then um, yeah, there, there were other clubs I go to in central London, a club called Bungie's, a club called Cousins, a club called The Troubadour, where you know Paul Simon played, Bob Dylan played, you know, when they came over to the UK. Uh, so, so it was a very, very thriving folk scene. So um, that, that was part of the diet of, of growing up in London in the 60s, which was a fantastic place to be at that time because it was all happening in London right there. So uh, you, you had the folk scene, which was a, a separate thing at the time. It, it didn't overlap very much. Uh, if, if there's been a change in the last you know, 50 years, so it's the fact that the, the, the UK folk scene has become much closer to the mainstream, uh, and there's much more of an overlap. Although, although it's smaller, that there are less places to play. Um, so uh, that, that's a sort of a, a, a folkish qualification right. for my <laughs> well, psychedelic ramblings. We, we think you're very well qualified, and it wasn't necessary, but, but it's a wonderful background to have for all of this. Um, and, <laughs> and, but what was interesting about, about Fairport Convention at the beginning, to a certain extent, was that you weren't playing that material at first. You were playing a lot of um, covers of, of songwriters, some of whom were American, of course, uh, and Bob Dylan and, and folks like that were part of yeah. uh, Fairport's repertoire. So what, were you, what was your thought about building a repertoire for the group at first? Well, um, well we were playing folk rock. That's still folkish, isn't it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> It's folk, but it's got drums. Um, uh, I, I suppose, um, yeah, well, uh, you know, the, the, the people who became Fairport, uh, we started playing together probably at 65, 66. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, Ashley, our bass player, who, who is our Eminence Grise at age 22, um, Eminence, uh, Eminence Noir, um, uh, said, oh, the, the, there's a gig at the, at the Blues Club. Um, so so we, we'll, we'll need a blues repertoire. So, so we, we learn some blues songs. We go and play at the blues club. They said, "Well, um, there's a gig at the folk club. Uh, we need to be like an acoustic um, uh, uh, quintet. So, so we'll, we'll add Judy Dibble and then we'll go and do a, do a folk set. You know. So, so we, we, we were basically uh, um, pursuing the work, uh, and we, we would mould ourselves in, into whatever shape um, seemed appropriate. Um, but probably 66, we started to, 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 to get more, more of a folk rock repertoire. So we were playing bird songs, we were playing um, Phil Oak songs, we were playing um, you know, uh, uh, blues covers as well, um, Loving Spoonful numbers. You know, we, we, we were just uh, like a covers band. Even Johnny Cash and Joni Mitchell were in there? Um, eventually, I mean, we started playing Joni Mitchell songs in 1967 uh, when we, we, we found out that, that her, her demo records were, were with her publisher in London. It's before she made a record. So, uh, so we got her demos, uh, her acetates. Um, uh, and, and we got the basement tapes as well in 67. 
uh, the, the, the Bob Dylan basement sites. We were the first man to get those. No, no, we really were. We really were. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, you know, we, we, we went to, to, to Dylan's publisher in London and we said, um, have you got any uh, Dylan songs that haven't been, been released or published? He said, oh, here you are. <laughs> oh, thanks so much. You know, all this weird stuff that was the basement types, you know. Um, I, I went to Big Pink last year. I don't know if you've been there. It's great fun. Yeah, you, you, you can go and visit. Yeah, isn't it fun? There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a vibe there. It's a real atmosphere of, uh, you know, you, you, can, you can stand on the very spot where, you know, Garth sat or something. Or, <laughs> anyway. And, you know, to, to give a sense of, of the influence of that early Fairport, I was talking to uh, Michael Doucet not that long ago, mm. and he said that actually... Cajun Woman by Fairport had been an influence on him early on in, in revitalizing his interest in Cajun music. Well, that's a bit so, pathetic, yeah. isn't it, really? <laughs> <laughs> I'm very disappointed to hear that. I, 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 thought, I thought Michael was, was a bit more into his culture, you know? It's kind of, kind of sad. Well, he, he was, but, you know. Um, well, you know, you know we, we were an eclectic band. We, we, we were a lyric band. We, we really love lyrics. Um, Whoever they came from, they came from you and McCall, or, or, or they came from, from Phil Oaks, or you know, wherever. Uh, what we loved lyrics. Well, we did Leonard Cohen songs as well. Um, uh, what we met Leonard Cohen when he came to London. Uh, met with him at the BBC, and um, and, and had uh, a deep, meaningful conversations with, with, with Len. Um, which is really depressing. Um, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, but, but, but basically, I, I think we were always a lyric band. Um, fair put to this day, are a lyric band. When we started to play the traditional music of the British Isles, uh, much more in our repertoire in sort of 68, 69, um, uh, we were so excited at the power of, of the lyrics of, 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 of some traditional music. So some of these old ballads that, that go back, um, you know, certainly to the 1600s, uh, uh, but possibly a lot older than that, a lot older than that. Uh, but but so some of the first written versions are, are 1600s, 1700s. And um, it's just stunning, the quality of the lyrics uh, and how exciting these lyrics are. And you can imagine them, them uh, before TV, radio, when, when this was the news being transmitted, um, how incredibly uh, engaging uh, th th this process would be, that this oral tradition would be. Uh, and, and for us, it was so exciting to, to, to add the, the, the power of electric music um, to, 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 to these fantastic words um, uh, to, to create this whole new powerful genre. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, early on in Fairport's uh, recorded career, you started to do a couple of traditional songs. You did Madame in Town and you did She Moves Through the Fair. But the one that I think is probably thought of as a breakthrough uh, in terms of the performance and what it uh, brought on for the next album was uh, A Sailor's Life on, mm. on, on Half Breaking. Mm. So how did that song come about? How did that idea to get Dave Swarbrick in and do a, a folk arrangement of that yeah. type come about? I think uh, Sandy knew, uh, knew the song A Sailor's Life uh, probably from Martin Carthy, I, th I think from Martin Carthy. Um, and one uh, Evening. Well, we, we were playing in Southampton in, in London and um, in England, and um, and Sandy just started singing it back, backstage, and we thought, oh, that's great. You know, let's. You know, what key is that? Okay, great. Let, let's. Uh, well, let, let's just do it tonight. We'll just do it and see what happens on stage. You know, we'll, we'll just play it. So uh, we performed it. And we, we put a kind of a you know a, like a, a guitar solo section into it because. Um, that's what people did in those days. That, that, that's, that, that's the reason we, we, we did it. I mean, you know, that was just acceptable to, to have you know, a 10-minute guitar solo. Like, it. I'm serious, I'm serious. Uh, um, you, you, can, you can only play music that's acceptable to the audience. You know? uh, otherwise, your audience you, you will disappear. Um, and at that time, um, you know, long instrumental passages were, were, were very, very accepted by the audience. So, um, so, so when we did A Sailor's Life, we, we, we uh, took to it in, in the way that, that a jam band would, you know, like, like the Grateful Dead would or something. So, so, so we kind of took it and then we kind of made it our own, uh, you know, instrumentally and, uh, and we extemporized upon it. Um, and uh, Joe Boyd, our producer, uh, heard it and, and said, uh, okay, we, we have to get in the studio uh, with this. Um, and someone suggested bringing in uh, Swarbrick on fiddle. I can't remember who that was, um, which was the first time that he played with us. 
And so uh, we assembled at Olympic uh, Studios, uh, Olympic Studio One, which is uh, like, like the, which is the, used to be the big Olympic Studios. It, it's now a supermarket, unfortunately, sadly. It should, should be a national monument. Um, yeah. uh, a, few, a few years ago, um, uh, someone uh, w was, was passing by the studio, when it was still a studio, uh, and they noticed a dumpster outside the studio, uh, and the dumpster was full of 24-track tapes. Uh, and the, this person started lo looking at the, these tapes, and it was like the Rolling Stones, the Who, the Beatles. So uh, he, he had the, the um, presence of mind to, to, to grab these tapes and, and, and contact the, the bands involved and say, look, look what I've got, do you want to do something with, it, with, with, it, with this music? But, but basically, they didn't have any more storage space, so, so they were thro throwing all this stuff out. Anyway, so, so Olympic was a great studio, and um, so we assembled at Olympic Studios, um, and we didn't even do a run-through with Swalbrick. So, so, so um, all I said to Swalbrick before we recorded, I said, I said um, do you see this as major or minor? <laughs> And he said, well, both, I suppose. <laughs> so I said, oh, OK. Uh, and, and that was it for, for preparation, you know. Um, and we knew that the, 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 the song was, was, was going to have um, a, um, a, a beginning that, that was, fr that was uh, in free time. Uh, and, and, and then uh, a, a groove would kick in at a certain point. And then after the last verse, well, we would extemporize out. Uh, uh, so we knew that much. So, so we, you know, we, we just kind of played, um, uh, and in a sense, um, it, it didn't go according to plan. Um, we, we, we sort of messed it up, you know. Uh, but um, in messing up, I, I think we, we created some, something more interesting. Um, uh, and I, th I think the secrets to that track, I, I think it's an extraordinary track. I'm very, very proud of it, having been involved in that. Um, uh, the, 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 the secret of that track is restraint. Um, it's swore benign uh, list listening to each other because we, we don't know what the hell we're, we're get, each person's going to do. So uh, we're listening to each other, you know, who's, who, is it major or minor? Oh, he's just played a major, okay, I'll play a major. Oh, now he's played a, now he's played a minor seventh, okay, fine, I'll play a minor seventh. Um, uh, but, so there's always, but backwards and forwards between swore, swore and myself, so, so we never really, um, you know, get um, comfortable. And the other interesting thing is that Simon Nickel, um, for some reason, introduces this guitar riff about halfway through that totally makes the track. Um, he'd never played it before, you know, um, probably didn't think much of it, but he just started playing this riff that gives the thing a real impetus. And the other thing that happens is that Martin, our drummer, um, um, d d doesn't kick into the groove where he's supposed to. He, he just holds back, and he holds back, and he holds back, and he holds back, and he holds back, uh, until <clears throat> when the groove finally kicks in, it's like, wow, at last, you know. But but it really, really swings at that point. Um, so so I think that's three things that, that really make that, that track into something really extraordinary. And it was it was the first take. That, that was the only take we did. We said, that's it, you know. So so we've now mentioned a couple of people that we might want to loop back and and say something about. Sandy, the singer on that track, was Sandy yeah. Denny, a well-known folk club performer at that time who came in and joined Fairport. And Swarbrick is Dave Swarbrick, who was uh, a great fiddler and was uh, at that time known for being in the Ian Campbell folk group, but had mm. been pretty much the leading fi fiddler on the English folk scene at that time. Everybody used him for their sessions. And yeah, well, he, he, he had a great um, a, a duo with Martin Carthy there. That was yeah, and the Martin Carthy. After, uh, yeah, yeah, after, yeah, after Ian Campbell, he, he was a couple of years um, touring with Martin. That was a fantastic uh, duo. Yeah, and then was again for many years as yeah, well. But, yeah. um, but so how did they come to join the group? I guess Sandy first, and you've explained a little with Dave, but how about Sandy? Yeah, um, well, um, Fairport always had a, had a female singer. Um, originally, it was Judy Diable. Um, uh, but Judy was a fairly delicate folk singer and, 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 and was kind of getting lost as the band became more powerful. So uh, we were looking for someone who, who could uh, have a stronger vocal presence. So, so we actually auditioned. Um, which is one of the most uh, depressing things that you can do, really, um, musically speaking, uh, is audition beat because uh, uh, it's so hit and miss, uh, and so many people are just not suitable. Well, you know, it's, it's it's like auditioning for a play or something. Uh, you, you just uh, you know you you, you want to kill yourself after about an hour. <laughs> it's so bad. 
But in comes Sandy, and she's absolutely extraordinary. She's absolutely extraordinary. <clears throat> and, um, you know, you know she's, she's got this big personality. Well, we were all sort of shy North London boys, you know, who, who went to nice schools. Um, and uh, in comes Sandy, sort of, you know, swearing and, and smoking and drinking. And, and um, we thought, oh, shit, we're going to have to keep up with her. <laughs> <laughs> which we did, which we did. Um, um, and, and she was just an extraordinary personality. I, I, you know, she, she could be incredibly sort of touchy, moody, or absolutely hilarious. She could be so, so funny. Um, so we, we sort of hit it off right away. You know, she, she was the obvious choice um, to, to audition. And um, and for, from that point, uh, we started to 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 uh, to work on some of Sandy's uh, traditional songs. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I mean, that, so that was a big part of what then came next for. For Fairport, but at the same time, you also started to write songs with with Dave, um, and there's a couple of great Swarbrick Thompson uh, collaborations. I think so. Yeah, yeah. How did those work? Um, well, it was sort of unlikely in a sense. I, I mean, um, y you know, from the outside, you wouldn't think we have much musical um, empathy, but um, what we do is. Uh, um, it was certainly like 1970 where we lived in this um, converted pub. It wasn't very well converted. Um, <laughs> but there's a whole story about, about this place. It was, it was called The Angel. It had a nice name anyway. The Angel. Uh, um, and, and it was in uh, uh, this little village in Hertfordshire. It was about an hour from London. And, um, and uh, we moved there literally in desperation. The Swarbrick had already, uh, already had his wife and his kid and all his furniture in, in, in the truck. Uh, he'd left his, his house, he sold his house. He's in the truck and he's heading towards the London area. And he said, well, what's the address? Where am I going? We, we said, well, shit, we don't know. I mean, we don't know. Do <laughs> oh, there's this, this place that we rejected, you know. Um, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to go there, you know. We, 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 reject, we, we, we rejected it because it was it's cold and damp um, and extremely uncomfortable and he had one bathroom. Uh, and uh, let's see, at the time we had, so there's five in the band, for, for four, of the, four of the band were married, so that's nine, and, and there's two kids, 10, 11, uh, at plus three Roku, 12, 13, 14, 40 people to one bathroom. <laughs> not only one bathroom, we're not talking about constant hot water here, we're talking about a li little tank that's sat on the wall. Yeah, you, you've been to Europe. Okay. <laughs> Little, little, little takes. So, yeah, so, so 14 people had to, you know, it's, it's a miracle of, of, of cooperation and, and <laughs> brother, brotherly love. And, yeah. um, where was I? So, well, we were going to talk a little about, <laughs> about Oh, yeah, oh, the songwriting process. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so in, 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 this, in this disused pub, there was, there was a sort of a, like a function room where they'd hold, hold dances and weddings and stuff. So, so Swab and I would light the fire and we'd sit around the fire. And he'd say, uh, I've got this tune. And he'd play this tune. And, and, and I'd say, that's a kind of weird tune, Swarp. You know? He'd say, yeah, it's weird, isn't it? So, so I'd put chords to it. Uh, and then I, I'd go away and write the lyrics later. Um, and that was our process. But, but Swarp would come up with extraordinary tunes. I mean, just amazing stuff. Um, that bore no resemblance to the musical world he came from. And, and I'd say, Swarp, you know, where, 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 where's the tune come from? He'd say, oh, it's a bit like the Alexander Brothers. And I'd say, who? And he's quoting some sort of like uh, some variety act from the 1930s. I'm thinking, you know, what? You know. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Well, at, at that moment in Fairport's history, something happened that was kind of transformative, I think, for the band in a number of ways. And that was a terrible motorway accident in which um, two people were killed, including your girlfriend at the time. Talk about the, the effect that that had on, on the group. Well, um, our drummer was killed, uh, yeah, Ma Ma Martin yeah. Lamble. Uh, so um, it, it was deeply traumatic uh, for the band. Um, uh, to the point where, you know, I, I, I think we were in shock, some kind of a post-traumatic shock for, for, for a couple of years, a couple of years after that. Um, and uh, we, we got together and said, well, what, what are we going to do? Are, are we going to carry on? Um, if this is the price that you pay for being on the road, is it actually worth it? Or would we be better be better off just doing other jobs? And so um, it, it took us a while to uh, to come around to the idea that, that this is what we did, this is what we did best, this is, and we should carry on. And and Martin would want us to carry on. So um, the, the, that that was a big watershed 
for, for the band. Um, we, we didn't want to go back and do the material that we did with Martin. We, we didn't want to do anything old at all. We just wanted a clean break and wanted to go forward. So, so we, we, we thought maybe now this is the time for this project that we've been talking about. We, we're talking about doing an album of just traditional music, um, uh, which uh, could be a kind of a, like a signpost for us and, and for other people in Britain, you know. Um, so uh, the, the summer after the after the crash, uh, we rented a house down in Hampshire in the country. It was, it was a beautiful idyllic setting, um, and it was, a, it was a kind of kind summer where where the sun shone occasionally. Um, um, and, uh, and and we worked very hard on on uh, on, on material for this album. Um, and uh, at the end of the phone, if we needed help, there, there was A.L. Lloyd, you know, Britain's leading folklorist. You know, there was. Cyril Tawney, uh, one of Britain's great singers and writers and folk song collectors. You know, there was Martin Carthy on the end of the phone. No, there was you know, anybody could chip in a verse or something, you know, if we were struggling to find a version of something. So, um, so this is how, um, in the ballad, uh, uh, Matty Groves, um, we were on the phone to Bert Lloyd and he said, um, you know, uh, the, you know, the, 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 up, the, you know, Lord Arnold, you know, jumped up at a loudy heated ball, you know. Uh, and we, we said, what's that name again? Uh, Lord Arnold. So we, we put like Lord Darnell, D-A-R-N-E-L-L-L. -L. Uh, and we, we thought that's what it was for a couple of years. This is the folk process in, in action. <laughs> this, is, this is oral transmission as it happens. This is a condensed version yeah. of what happens to a folk song. Um, well, they call it a game of telephone. And yeah, yeah. That's sort of that, that's what it was. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, so uh, then at the end of the summer, uh, we went and re recorded the album called uh, Legion Leaf, which was um, uh, it was a different album, uh, um, uh, and, it, and it was um, seminal record. Uh, and uh, that September, we 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 we, uh, we debuted it at um, Royal Festival Hall. <coughs> uh, Johnny Mitchell opened for us. That was the only time. <laughs> I think my Jenny Mitchell and, and Nick Drake are opening. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. So, what was that concert like? Uh, yeah, it was really good. It was really good. <laughs> <laughs> but it was interesting. Um, um, uh, you know, Al Lloyd was there, but Bert Lloyd was there. He loved it. He, he thought that was fantastic. He said it's the most exciting thing he's seen, uh, you know, in, in traditional music for, for like 20 years. Um, people like uh, Lou Killen, you know. Great folk singer, um, loved it. You know, um, other people hated it. it. It was very divisive. It, it was a bit, bit like, like Dylan going electric. You know, it, it's the same effect. You know, uh, the real, you know, staunch um, conservative um, uh, um, elements of, of the folk scene um, were, were very uncomfortable um, with this record. Um, but, um, but, but you know, it had an effect. It had an effect on the on the British folk scene because from that you have bands like Steel Eye Span, um, uh, the, the, the whole the, the whole British folk rock scene uh, from there. Um, people uh, but, but people people in Sweden said, "Oh, we, sh we should be doing this to our folk tradition." Uh, people in in Holland s said this. People in Spain said this. Um, Los Lobos in America said, uh, "Oh, well, we should we should be playing uh, traditional Mexican music." As, a, as part of what we do, so, so, so that, that album had, a, had a, an effect in, in many other places. Mm -hmm. That's great, and, and yeah, I mean, I think it's been one of the most um, influential folk albums, certainly in the in the British tradition. Um, one thing that that's interesting about it, so we've talked about some of the songs, Matty Groves and Tam Lin, these great old ballads, but but it also has on it a, a set of tunes, which is one of the first times people rocked out in that particular way on on traditional folk tunes of yeah. the British and Irish tradition. Yeah. So talk about that, the process of putting that track together. Um, uh, Swarb would, would usually uh, assemble uh, the, the tunes. He'd say, I've, I've got this set of tunes. You know, this one, this one, this one, this one. Uh, um, um, and we'd say, great, um, let's hear them. OK, let's, l let's hold back here. You know, let's play a drone here. L let's, uh, l let's play chords under this bit here. You know, uh, let's play unison here. Um, and uh, you know, it, it, it was really effective uh, dance music. I mean, it was super loud. I mean, we were a loud band in those days. We, were, you know, we, we, we had large amplifiers. Um, 
And uh, when we when we played the the, the jigs and reels uh, in concert, uh, you know, people stand up and, and, and start stomping their feet and dancing, and, and it was it was it was wild. It was insane. Uh, we played the Philadelphia Folk Festival, 1970. Anybody there? And, uh, and it was amazing. Well, wasn't it incredible? Like the entire festival was dancing. It was, it was just spectacular. So. Um, I mean, for, for us, that was just a logical thing to do. I, 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 the same as taking the uh, the songs uh, and, and making them in, 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 into this powerful contemporary thing. Um, it was the same with uh, the, with the dance music, and, and um, you know that had an obvious effect in, in, in places like, like Ireland, where, where, where you know, it started a whole Irish sort of amplified um, jigs and reels right. tradition. You know. Yeah. So one of the things that kind of developed out of that in, in your guitar playing, I think, is that you continued to do that with you know, even when you weren't with a Fairport-style band. But then you had to develop strategies for playing traditional tunes on the guitar, which was not a traditional instrument for yeah. And you hear kind of accordion sounds in your guitar playing and bagpipe sounds in the drones that you play. Um, how do you manage to make that transfer? Uh, I think when, when you bring an instrument in, into a tradition, um you, you have to bend it, whatever that instrument is. Um, you, you, you bend it and turn it into something closer to a human voice. So, um, so something like a fiddle, which has been in in, in European tradition for, for you know perhaps a, you know a millennium. Who knows? Um, uh, in uh, ha, ha, has vocal inflections in it. Um, you, 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 you hear people singing, um, uh, like in the, in the Shetlands or something, or, or Orkney. Uh, um, that's how they sing. Uh, so, um, uh, and, and the fiddle might, might have been Im imitating uh, the, the ornamentation on, 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 on a, a bagpipe, or vice versa. Um, if, if, if you bring an instrument like a harp into the tradition, well, the harp's, the harp's been there before anything else, probably. Uh, but, but, but it's the same thing. You, you bring these little vocal inflections into it. Um, uh, if you play a traditional tune, you're playing it different every time, depending on the ornamentation and the, the, the kind of pushes that you put into it. Um, classical musicians have a hard time understanding this. Uh, they, they think you, you, you play a tune, uh, you, you play the tune, you, you, pl you play what's written. I, I, and uh, you, 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 tr you try to bring the page to life. But it's, it's a different process. Whereas uh, traditional music, uh, you, 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 if you learn, learn a tune from, from, the, from the notation, then um, you say, okay, okay, I've got it. I understand how it works. Now, now I can play it. Now, now, now I can put my own inflection into it. Okay. But every, every time you play it, it's a, it's a little bit different. It's a little bit different, a little bit different. Um, yeah, the page was trying to capture something that already was live. It's, it's the other way around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, that, yeah. yeah. So um, you yeah, know, the, the the guitar that doesn't um, sit so well for, for for a lot of traditional music. I, I, so sometimes you have to, be, have to be very selective about the tunes that you play and the keys that you play them in, uh, or you, you have to go to other tunings. Um, that there are tunings that, that are sometimes more suitable. Uh, but you know, any, any instrument tuned in fifths. Um, it's a lot easier to play most traditional music. Uh, guitar's tuned in fourths, so you have to stretch, you have to adapt. Um, uh, and it's sometimes a matter of compromise. So sometimes there are things that you can't cover uh, as well as another instrument, but, but sometimes that's how the tradition changes as well. Um, sometimes you, you can't do a fiddle lick, so, so you do a kind of guitar lick instead. Um, and it still has a kind of validity to it, even though it might not be authentic. It's just stretching it in, into a different kind of future, you know. So, so we've talked a little about your your adaptation of traditional music, which is one kind of strand of the folk family. Yeah. Um, but another thing that you then went into fairly soon after your Fairport experience was the acoustic singer-songwriter experience with with Richard and Linda, and then with your own. Um, work. Talk about that, about about developing your songwriting um, in first, you know, maybe in the context of the end of Fairport, but of your involvement with Fairport, but then also uh, your own career starting. Up. Okay. Um, well, you know, I, I started um, writing songs at a time when um, uh, obfuscation was um, was uh, de rigueur. 
<laughs> really. Um, I suppose, you know, it starts with Bob Dylan, who, who uh, was um, taking um, the, 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 the traditional music um, structure but, but then he was being more poetic with it. He, he was putting in more poetic ideas, putting more poetic imagery, uh, and was being more obscure in, in a way that a poem it, it can be obscure, but a song can't necessarily. Uh, if, you, if you listen to a Hank Williams song, uh, there, there, there's no obscurity in it. Listen to any country song. Country song has to hit you between the eyes, has to be immediate. Uh, you, you can't have a, a line that, 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 that doesn't speak immediately to, to the storyline. Um, so uh, what Dylan was doing was kind of changing the rules. Um, and uh, he was bringing intelligence to popular music when he started to have hits. Uh, um, that was the f really the first time that, that, that you could have an intelligent lyric in a popular song. Uh, and so you had all, all, those, all those great protest songs uh, in the 60s uh, because of Dylan. Um, and it got to the point, you know, it, it gave validity to um, to uh, almost almost a, a, everything in in rock music from that point. Any to almost any any lyric that you wanted to come up with, um, political songs. You could write songs like you know, like songs like "You Too," right? Um, would, wouldn't exist without without Bob Dylan in 1963, 64, 65. Um, songs that Radiohead write well, wouldn't exist well, without the, the same thing. You know, but popular music was, um, you know, um, uh, sentimental, simplistic, um, uh, you know, um, um, stupidly simplistic sometimes, you know. <laughs> really, really. Um, uh, I, 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 I'm not serious music. It, it, it almost wasn't, wasn't adult music. You know, uh, the, the, the generation that, the, of, of sort of Cole Porter's uh, and uh, Frank Lesser's, you know, I, 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 I kind of gone away and, and um, you yeah, had sort of 50s, you know, Brill Building stuff. You know, it just wasn't, wasn't interesting. So Dylan really changed the rules and, and made um, songwriting into, into a far more interesting process. So, um, so, so me, Sandy Denny, Nick Drake, to name three, um, uh, were obscure in their writing. <laughs> obscure in their writing. Uh, you listen to what, what, one of Sandy's songs, you're thinking, well, you know, what, what's it about? It's very beautiful. It has this beautiful shimmery surface to it, but, but what's it about? Uh, and it, it's about, you know, two years ago that, that I was re reading a biography of Sandy and I thought, oh, you know, the, the, you know the, 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 that song's about Jackson C. Frank. I, I never knew, you know. Um, but because cause it's, it's all like encoded, yeah. you know, she's got this whole code that you have to unlock to figure out who the song's about. Well, one thing that's interesting about that, I think, is that a lot of the times with uh, with your songs, people have a tendency to listen to them and assume that there's something autobiographical about them, as opposed to them being little works of fiction, which yeah. they could also be. Yeah. And so people are always looking for the key in your life as opposed to maybe something that you'd read or some other, uh, some yeah. other uh, influence. I have to so be careful talk, what I say here. Can, well, can people, you talk about that? Because I know that yeah. people do interview you and you sometimes say, no, that song's a, you know, that's, that's a character that I've created, that's not me. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I really do both. Um, um, and, and, and I love the fact that I can do both, that the, the, the audiences will, will, will not know the difference sometimes. I, I, and the audiences, I'm, I'm very grateful, audiences listen anyway to, to tell you what I do, it's fantastic. Um, uh, uh, there are songs, I mean, there's a song on, on my last album um, called, uh, it's called uh, Dungeons for Eyes. And, and it, it's a song about, about meeting someone at a, at a charity event. Uh, it's a true story. So this, this is about me, it's about my life, this is true. I, I, I meet this guy at a charity event and uh, I, 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 you know, I, I'm, I'm chatting to some other people and someone says, oh, you, you must come over and meet so-and-so. And, and I look at this guy and, and I know that he's, he's, he used to be a terrorist. He's now a politician, but he used to be a terrorist. And I know that when he was a terrorist, if he didn't actually kill people himself, he was responsible. He, he, he directed people to kill other people. And I thought, I, I cannot shake this man's hand. I cannot go there. <clears throat> 
So, um, <clears throat> so, so, so that, that kind of haunted me for a long time. Um, and, and I think it, it, it's when these things haunt you that, that, that you end up writing songs about them, to just, just to kind of get it out there somewhere, uh, to kind of understand it. You know, so so you, you can say, okay, there, there it is. Now I can see it. Now I can understand what that was. Um, I, I wrote a song called, uh, on, also on the last record, called uh, Broken Doll, which was about um, going way back, way back to, to when I was like 19 years old, possibly 18 years old. Uh, and I'm playing with Fairport, uh, and we're playing in, I think it was Leicester. And after the show, uh, the, 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 these people in, 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 in uniforms, like kind of um, you know, nurses' uniforms, come backstage and they say, we've got this girl here. Um, you know, she, she's uh, institutionalized. Uh, she, she's, she's, you know, um, she, she has mental issues. Um, she'd love to meet you. She's your biggest fan. I said, oh, okay. Uh, and this girl comes back uh, and, and she's um, crazy. And um, they, they leave me in a room with her. Why would they do that? Why would they do that? Uh, and... Um, you know, you know she, she, she's, she's, uh, um, she, well, she, she, you know, she, she does crazy things. I, I, I can't go into detail right now, but she does crazy things. That, you know, she's a bit, she, like, she, she's a bit incontinent. You know, she's kind of messed up in so many ways. I, don't, I, don't, I, I just felt <clears throat> so um, sad for this girl. It's so kind of tragic. Um, but it took me a long time to ex express this. It, it took me until like two years ago. Yeah. To, to get round round to actually expressing that you know the pain that I felt about, about the situation uh, and how difficult it was. <clears throat> so, um, so the, the real songs. Yeah, you know, other songs. A lot of songs I write. I don't even know if they're real or, or, or fantasy. I just don't know. I, in a sense, I don't care when I'm writing them. I, I just I, I just write stuff. Yeah, you know, Picasso said I, I never censor myself. He, he said that's the job of critics. So that's not my job. He said I I, I just I, you know I paint, I sculpt, I do what I do. Um, but, but I don't censor myself, and I think there's a lot to be said for that. Well, sometimes you know you do have to leave the meaning of the song for the world to discover. Yeah. I think that in in your songwriting, one example of that is "Meet on the Ledge," which has come to mean a lot of things that it didn't mean when you wrote it, if you know what I mean. Because yeah. of the first the van crash, and then the all kinds of things. I mean, you mentioned that your that your mother asked for it to be played at her funeral. Yeah. Um, could you talk about that song and how it's developed in meaning over the years? Um, <clears throat> well, you know, it's it's a you know, it's a juvenile song. It's an immature song. It's a song I wrote when I was nineteen, uh, and you know, it, it's a classic example of of you know uh, um, a song with it with it with, with it, uh, the meaning obscured. I, I think I, when, I, when I was young, I, I didn't want people to see into me. I, I, I didn't want people to know what I was thinking, what I was writing, writing about. So um, uh, I, I just put a layer over everything, you know. And if anybody asked me, I'd say, well, I, you know, it's, it's, about, it's about somebody else, so, you know, uh, that's easy. So me on the ledge, I mean, I, I don't really know what it's about, even though I wrote it. <laughs> um, but because, um, you, you know, as a songwriter, you're in this unique position. As a singer-songwriter, you're in the unique position of, of having to reinterpret your earlier work. You, you know, if, 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 you, if you do a painting and you sell it to, to someone in Santiago, um, you're never going to see it again. Yeah, maybe these days you take, take, a, take a photograph of it, you know, but it's gone. You know, when, you know, when, when uh, you know, Poussin painted a landscape, you know, he'd keep his, the sketches of it, maybe. But the, the picture was gone. You didn't never see it again. Uh, as a singer-songwriter, you, 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 you might, depending on, on the whims of the audience, you, you might be re revisiting stuff fr fr from the beginning of your career. And this is so weird. This is it's just a strange thing. Uh, I, I kind of kind of unique to, to the singer-songwriter process, I think. So um, you know, meet on the ledge. People ask for it, and I think, well, you know, that this guy's been a fan for like 50 years. You know. You know, I can't let him down. You know, I, I have, have to sing this song, and 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 I have to find a way that this song means something to me. I can't just sing it empty. I have to find emotion in this song for me now. 
and sometimes that's hard. But but you know when I sing Meet on the Ledge, I I I think about you know his people uh, around that song, uh, and I think what that song means to me. I, I, and some of the lines that I find obscure, they're, they're, then I make up my own different meaning now for what 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 it, what it means to me now. Um, so uh, yeah, it's it's a weird process. Yeah. yeah. Well, that song, of course, is sung every year at the end of the Fairport Reunion Festival at Property. So it's built up this annual meaning of of you know nostalgia as well. Yeah. Um, and just yeah. uh, and it it is a great song in its way. I mean, I know you you think of it as being a a juvenile song, but it is also a great song. So I, I don't know. I don't think it is. I really don't. <laughs> I don't. Well, I'm not going to argue with you <laughs> over this. But um, but uh, let's talk a little bit more about songwriting and and one thing that was an influence on you uh, on on your songwriting, probably starting in the the early 70s, was uh, religion and and Sufism and Sufi poetry. Mm. Night comes in and songs like that. Mm. Talk about how that affected your your songwriting as well. Well. Um it's all about love, isn't it? Um, you know, love, as they say, makes the world go around. I think it actually literally does make the world go around. Um, so, uh, you know, Sufism, uh, any kind of spiritual path that, that you follow, anything that you believe in, anything you believe beyond, you know, the, the, what, you could, what you can see and feel, um, uh, what, what they call faith, what they call spirituality of any, any sort, uh, affects everything that you do. You know, even if you do some kind of, a, if you do TM or something, if you do yoga, any of these things, they, 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 they start to affect everything that you do and the way that you look at the world. So it does have an influence. Um, and uh, I, I could say that the music of Andalusia, what, what they call Andalus, which is the kind of, of poetry that, that, that my teachers in Morocco um, uh, were immersed in, um, uh, it w had a huge influence, uh, it, just about being acknowledged now, uh, on uh, the music of the rest of Europe, be be because um, the, the music of, of Andalusia in, in the sort of 8th to 14th century um, was this very r romantic poetry uh, 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 about chivalry. Uh, it, it was about, about uh, like very, very n the noblest ideas of, of love. Um, uh, and then this became the, the, the common currency of the troubadours uh, and the trouvères in, in France, in, in the, starting in the, in the 1100s, uh, up to the sort of 1300s, 1400s. Um, and that in turn influenced the Meister singers in Germany, and it went to Italy, and it went to Britain. Um, so I, 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 I do think that the, the, the music of the Moors in, in Andalusia um, uh, did, did, did have, did have a, an influence that, that we can't hear anymore because we're so close to it, but, but it really influenced your, your, your European music. So, so for me, Andalusian music sounds Western, for the most part sounds Western. It doesn't sound Middle Eastern, just sounds like the music we already know. Um, and it also has a lot of the qualities um, that, um, that, that I learnt about, about songwriting and about poetry in school. Uh, in school, that they would teach you uh, W. B. Yeats, uh, and they'd say, look, "Look at the symbolism here. You know, uh, you, uh, here's, here's the surface of the poem. Look, look at the symbols." Yeah, well, we, we also studied, um, you know, uh, Robert Graves. We, stu we studied the White, the White Goddess. Um, so, um, uh, uh, you know, symbolism, mythology, uh, uh, all these things that that you, you can put in, into a song underneath, underneath everything else. You can just slip it in there. But it can still be a pop song. It can still be a pop yeah. song. So, so um, th th there was, there was nothing really in, in uh, you know, like Andalusian poetry that, that was new. It, it was just, um, it was, uh, it was ju just, it was aiming somewhere else. It, it, it was just aiming higher, aiming higher. And you always had quite literary influences in your songwriting. I mean, I guess your your one of your first published songs was called Decameron, right? So. So, so you were working with things well, that you learned in that way. Pretentious title, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> but, but what about other literary influences in in your writing? Um, just lots of them. I, I mean, I, I always say, you know, you know, the the biggest influence on me is probably 
um, traditional ballads. Um, there's, there, you, you, where do you go to learn songwriting? Um, I, I can't think of, of anywhere better that you, you would go than the, the, than those old ballads, you know, the, those ballads that we used to sing in Fairport. I mean, they're just so, so extraordinarily strong. Uh, you know, you know, the imagery is so clear. You know, that um, the, they appeal to the senses. You know, he, he man, you know, the, the, the king sits in down firmly town, drinking the blood red wine. You know, there, there's always some qualification. Uh, he, he mounted her on a milk white steed. Um, the, 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 so so you, you you get this the, this sensory picture in the songs. Um, the, the 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 bad verses have disappeared like 200 years ago. The, 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 <laughs> th th through the oral tra oral tradition, the 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 the, the, bag, the the bad verses get winnowed away. They they they, they, they get they get filtered out b because uh, people don't en enjoy singing them because they don't advance the plot uh, or, or they they they're not beautiful enough. Uh, it, it, sometimes an ugly verse. Um, uh, will be transformed into a beautiful verse but by a singer or by the local schoolmaster or the local uh, priest in a village you know he'll he'll kind of um, tidy up a song uh, and then that kind of slips back into the tradition again you know but in an sort of improved version um, uh, <laughs> uh, people like Robert Burns uh, Walter Scott um, uh, uh, but the Baroness Nairn, Lady Nairn, Carolina Olfen, um, uh, you, these, these people were folk song collectors and also folk, folk song um, uh, adapters. Uh, and they, they'd also write their own songs to, to, to traditional tunes. Um, so, so these people were, were part of the process. Uh, but people sing burn songs with, without knowing whether, whether it's an original burn song. I mean, we, we sing Old Lang Syne, is, is that an original burn song? Or, or did he adapt it for, from an older tune and an older idea? Uh, probably the latter. Um, he said the latter, but there's no Yeah, idea. okay, there you go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. Well, yeah. So, yeah. Well, so, 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 so let's, yeah, let, let's talk a little also, you mentioned several of the of the writers that you mentioned as influences and many of the ballads that you sung are are Scottish in origin and and you have that as as part of your family heritage so talk about your Scots background and how that might have influenced you uh, well um, you yeah, know my father was an exiled Scot so, so he, he was uh, he, he was in the police in London um, he left the Scottish borders, you know, when he was quite young, uh, came down to London. But like a lot of um, exiles, he was more Scottish th 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 than the Scots, you know. So um, uh, he, ne he never missed a Burns night. Uh, that was always a, always a very b a big thing on the calendar. Uh, you know, uh, New Year's Eve, Hogmanay was always, um, you know, a big party at our house. And um, uh, also, like every year, sometimes twice a year, we go up to Scotland for, for the summer holidays, sometimes for Christmas as well. And, um, and I think some of, the, uh, some of the earliest music I ever heard live was Scottish music. So, you know, things like pipe bands, um, you know, accordion dance bands. Um, I, that's when I was like three, four years old, you know, or, or even younger. That's just my earliest musical memories are of, of uh, hearing, you know, like, like, like a lone piper, like outdoors. You know, like a you know, hundred yards away, but ju just that sound, you know, just that extraordinary sound. Um, uh, and, and I'm still droning. I'm, I mean, I, I still in my, in my, in my guitar playing, I, I, I love using drones. I, I, I love the, the sound of, of, of the drone and the melody, uh, not necessarily the harmony. Um, so, uh, um, g growing up in the 1950s, um, th there was this thing called uh, the, the tea time of the soul. The tea time of the soul. The, 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 this was the time b between. Um, the last interesting radio program on, on about 2.30 to, to the first interesting t TV show at like 7.30. There, 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 there'd be these hours of like nothing. Uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it's winter in Britain. It's cold, it's miserable, it's gray. Uh, you can't go out, you know, your, your friends are doing something else. So you, you're in the house and there's nothing to do. There's nothing to do. So, uh, you know, um, in our house uh, there's bookshelves and on, on the bookshelves there's the Waverley novels by Walter Scott. Yeah, there, there's complete Robert Burns. There, 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 there complete this, that, now all, all these books, books of poetry that were, were actually about my grandfather's and my great grandfather's. 
So uh, bored to death, I just start reading this stuff, you know. Um, and and the, this book's of border ballads, you know. So I, I start reading these border ballads, the, the doughy dens of Yarrow, you know, this sort of stuff. I think, wow, this is pretty cool. But it, it, it wasn't on the front burner. This, this was not exciting uh, as Gene Vincent, you know, as a kid. You know, so, so the music coming from my, sis, my sister's bedroom, you know, Jerry Lee Lewis, you know, Buddy Holly. This was exciting. This was like immediate. This was fantastic. And this, this other stuff was just something I was doing, you know, to, to pass the time. But, 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 but when Fairport started playing traditional music, I said, oh, okay, I, 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 you know, uh, it's Patrick Spence. I, I, know, I know this one. That, that's, that's good, yeah. Matty Groves, yeah, okay, I know that one. Um, um, uh, when it came to writing our, our own material, it, kind of in that style, I said, okay, I can do this. It's like I'm, I'm, I'm trained for this, you know, from, a, from, a, from an early age. Well, if you, if you yeah. think about, you know, 1952, Vincent Black Lightning, one of your most famous and well-loved songs, it's essentially a traditional ballad set in modern days with a Scottish policeman in it even. So yeah. <laughs> uh, it's true, yeah. it's true. all of that is encapsulated <laughs> in that song. I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> So, <laughs> one other side of the of the sort of folk concept that you know folk music is is a, acoustic music. You know, a lot of people think of that as one of the defining characteristics. And you kind of have an interesting parallel career path going because you do electric band shows, but then you also do a, a healthy amount of just acoustic solo shows. Mm -hmm. Why did you decide to to do both of those things simultaneously? Um, probably to pay the rent, to tell you the truth. <laughs> um, uh, I can't survive as, as just an electric guitar player. Uh, I can't do it. Um, I, I can't get enough work that way. I can't afford to take a band on the road full time. Uh, if, if I tour the band, I, I break even. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if, I, if, I, if I tour solo, I, you know, I, I can earn, earn money. So, um, uh, but having said that, um, I mean, I started to do it, um, you know, a, a couple of times when uh, Linda was pregnant um, in, in the late 70s, you know, and I, I thought, oh, this is really fun. Um, th th there's something about playing acoustic music in, in a room, you know, to, to other people. Um, it's, it's almost like being in church. There's this kind of stillness, uh, and there's this sense of, of sort of um, commonality. And a, and a sense of, of um, you, you might be on the stage and you might be three inches higher than the rest of the audience, but, but you're actually the, the same as the audience. Everyone in the room it, it plays an equal part uh, in the process. Um, and if someone leaves the room, it changes, the energy changes. There's this thing that happens in the room and there's this communication that happens from heart to heart that's... Um, I mean, that's, that's, that's one of the best experiences you can have of, as a musician, is, is that, that, that sense that something has been communicated. And it's usually like, like just emotion. Like that's all it is, it's emotion. It's not necessarily ideas, it's, it's just something that's come across. And sometimes after a solo performance, someone will come up to you and they'll say, uh, I really love that song, I, I really got that, that meant a lot to me. You think, wow, fantastic. <clears throat> Job is done, you know. Um, but that, that's, that's the thing, you know, but, but playing with the band is a different thing. It, it, it's different. It, it's, it's more like you're, you're, you're more imposing yourself. You're imposing the music uh, onto the audience. And, and, and that, that can also be extraordinary. But be, because sometimes um, when you're playing electric, uh, the music just takes off. It, it just goes somewhere. It just flies. And, and, and that's, that's harder to do acoustic. Uh, where uh, acoustic, sometimes you're, you're more tied to certain patterns on the guitar because you've got to hold the whole thing down. So, so you, you can't do these solos that, that just go. Whereas with the band, when you have the support of other musicians, um, the, the things can, can just fly away beyond anything that, that, that you were expecting. Uh, and sometimes at the end of a song, you kind of look, look at each other and you say, okay, wow, fantastic. So I, I love the fact that I can do those two things. I have those, those two aspects. So it's also nice for the audience that I, I can tour, you know, I can play Scranton, New Jersey. Um, you know, acoustic one year, and I can come back the next year and, and with a band, uh, and it, it's a different thing, you know. So, so they're not getting the same old thing all the time. Yeah, and I, I should say I'm, I'm being being told that we're 
close to being out of time, so I should just tell everyone that you can see Richard do both of these things by keeping in touch with his tour schedule and going to see him live. And you can also buy albums of him doing both things because he's released, um, he's released, he's released three purely acoustic albums uh, quite recently, Acoustic Classics and Acoustic Classics 2 and Acoustic Rarities. But he's also, of course, maintaining his uh, great record of, uh, you know, electric albums. And there's even one called Electric recently. So uh, th th there's one in the can as well that comes out in the summer. So. Excellent. Yeah. So we're going to have that be the last word. <laughs> Applause for Richard Thompson.